Hello, bonjour, hiya, heya, hello, and priviet, hockey fans. I think that's all right. Uh, Hayden didn't send me the, the list of things, um, but my name is Chris Gadsby. Welcome to the Euro Book podcast and the eagle eyed amongst you if you're watching on our youtube channel will already see that uh, this week i'm on my own uh, hayden was on his own uh, last week while i was away with work and now because it's his birthday i've been very kind to him and given him the day off but don't worry we've still got a great show up for you today when we have in fact another fantastic guest uh, this week i've been speaking to uh, matt bradbury uh, who is a former ice hockey player for the Nottingham Panthers and the Solihull Barons and is now coach of the Great Britain University squad and the Nottingham Lions. We've spoken about everything from his playing career, the injury that cut it short, his coaching career and his plans for the future. We started by asking him all about how we got into our wonderful sport of ice hockey. So enjoy. Yeah, so joining us now on the Europuck podcast is Matt Bradbury, who a lot of people around the Nottingham ice hockey scene may well know. Um, but for those who don't, Matt, uh, just tell us a bit about yourself uh, and the roles you play in, in ice hockey, both in Nottingham and Great Britain. No, so I've been around hockey a long time. Started playing when I was obviously a kid back in the old Nottingham ice rink in the junior days. So I played under some, um, some, some really good coaches that are, are no longer with us, I'm afraid, but um, got many, many happy memories of, of growing up as a kid in the old Nottingham rink. And, um, and then fortunate enough, um, you know, still have contact with people so along my journey, along the ways, meeting these, these people and, and, and becoming like sporting friends. But also, you know, you might not see somebody for five, ten years, but then suddenly you see them the next day, you might bump into them or you might contact them online. It's like you've, you've never been apart. And it's, I think that's one of the bonds that, from from definitely my experience from being in the Nottingham Hockey Club um, is probably one of the, the best things ever. You know, looking aside from just the playing and the the coaching and everything, I think the bond that you get from being involved in in sport. Obviously, I can't compare it with with other sports, but definitely from the hockey fraternity and hockey world, there's there's never a time when you won't bump into someone and have an old story or a or a current story or looking out to help some of these these young kids coming through the program. So. Many happy, um, many happy times being in Nottingham. With uh, growing up as a junior, uh, fortunate enough to play with the Panthers in in the 1989-1990 season. Around that time, uh, when Nottingham were were British champions, we'd we'd we'd, we'd gone all the way through. Uh, our, our main rivals back in the junior days with with Durham, and um, you know just some amazing times with those 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 young people growing up. And like I say, and then. Um, Get, being fortunate enough to, to train and, and be involved with the Panthers set up in, in those days when there was only three imports and, um, and being around some, some, some of the, like I say, young players that, that are, um, are, again, are, are with us. And, and obviously there's a, some that aren't with us anymore, but it's, you know, playing, playing in those, in the old barn and, and, and meeting those you know, people. And, and that was just some real great memories I've had. So what, got you into the sport because you grew up in Nottingham kind of late 70s early 80s when football was everything particularly with the success of Nottingham Forest mm. uh, what what made you go no I'm going to do ice hockey instead it was just literally a, a chance to, to go down I went down to watch um, a game with my uncle and I remember I think I was I was with him sat up right in the back corner of block four at the old ice rink and um for those that know that this stadium, it, it was just rocking every every Panthers game. There were there was people waiting outside to try and get tickets, or you know, and, and if anybody had got a spare ticket, they were snapped up within seconds. And just memories of the old, you know, people standing outside selling the football posts straight after the you know the football, so people would go again straight from the football straight down the Panthers, and it was just absolutely rocking. And that atmosphere, I think, probably grabbed me, but also just the intensity of of, of the sport back in the eighties. I think I ended up watching the sport in the season when there was a few big punch-ups um, and the game was just, everybody was on the edge of the seats and um, it was just, it was just a, a great atmosphere. I thought, I want a piece of that. I was playing, I was playing football for like um, a local Saturday morning um, young, young kids team. Um, 
and I just uh, hockey, they did just just non-stop action. The puck hardly ever came out off off the rink, and it was just non-stop. And I think that's what grabbed my attention: the the intensity and and the, the ever-changing score line, and you know that kind of thing. It being you know being down by a goal, being up by two, being you know being back to a tied game, and it was just that, that kind of atmosphere, and, and and that's what grabbed me the most. Yeah, I think we. Myself and Hayden, my, my co-presenter, we have a lot of viewers and listeners from around Europe. And everybody always says, I watch my first game and then I'm hooked on it. And I think particularly in this country, there are a lot of people that still don't know, if you're not in like a Nottingham Sheffield or that don't know we have a professional ice hockey league. Was that yeah. very much the same for you in the sense of I saw it once and you were like, I'm going to love this sport for the next what four decades it is so far? Yeah, I mean, if, I just want. I, I then, I then, I was doing a bit of skating, but then it was a case of like, right, where, where do I? Is there any junior teams? Do I get a chance to go for a try, or can I, can I go for a, you know? So I started. And I was skating. I was down the rink, uh, four times a week. The only, I think, the only day we we didn't skate it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was figure skating and um, the organ, the old organ night on a on a Thursday with the the dance and the figure skate. So no hockey's on a Thursday, and then it was down on the on the Friday night, and it was just a case of palling up with a few of the the kids that were down there that were already in the club and they were encouraging people. And, 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 and again, you, you, you created that bond and um, yeah, went, went for a trial, failed my first trial because I couldn't stop both ways. Um, so I had to go away. I was in, I was gutted. I was in tears. So I went home and then had to, I'm never going to be able to do this. I can't do this, but you know, stuck at it, went down, worked harder. Cause again, I think there was, there was obviously less teams and, Obviously, only one ice pad, and obviously, you know, with the with the ice center, you know, um, having the two pads and, and more opportunities, and the the world changing with you know the addition to things like YouTube and and all these kind of social media channels that you can learn more from around the world without even leaving your house. We didn't have those kind of luxuries, um, so there was only one place you could buy your equipment from, and all that kind of stuff. So those kind of things were, were all little hurdles at the time, but you just. You just, that was what you knew and, and that's what you did. So I went down for a trial, eventually got in one of the teams. And again, that was where my, my sort of like, my journey started, meeting some, some of those, those people I've mentioned, you know, those kind of people that, that I suppose when I looked at it, that the experience I've gained throughout all those years, you know, uh, has made me the person I am today. And, and I think when you, when you reflect on being brought up around all of those British players and then only playing in the Panthers for that, for that one season before I headed off to, to Solly Hull, um, I think being around, you know, a low amount of imports and more Brits, that sort of like became my passion. And that, I think that's why uh, I do what I do today with the Lions in the development of the young players coming through the programme as soon as I possibly can. Um, and if we happen to pick up any university students that might happen to be imports um, that want to play hockey, then, then that's the way we look at it. But otherwise, I think that's where a lot of my ethos came from. The people that when I, when I was growing up and, and taught me and, and were my coaches, that's what I wanted to continue. What was that old rink like? Because without wanting to make you feel old, I'm not old enough to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm only ever, I've only ever known, known the new rink. And see, rinks get redeveloped all the time, particularly in, in the European countries. So a lot of our listeners might not know kind of how it was back in the 80s, as you said, with the one pad and the changing rooms, probably not quite as they are now. Um, character. It got a lot of character. It got a lot of characters in the building, I think, which obviously made the building from the staff. Um, the way that the setup was, there was um, there was two bars in there, um, and the and one of the main bars was well, there was actually three. There was a director's bar as well, but there was the, the main bar was close to the away team changing room, um, and literally players. I think the, the the most thing that was amazing was rubbing shoulders with the players as they they went for a drink after the game, and and it became that kind of real family kind of closer i mean it's a family sport now at the ice center in the arena but it's not as close it's not as up close and personal and i think that's what i think a lot of people will remember it got a, a big cafeteria it got a sweet shop it got a little sweet shop. okay and, uh, yeah 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 so um the guy who runs the sweet shop is still the chairman of the nottingham junior ice hockey club so he's still involved and he you know um it it, it was just that that kind of buzz and that feel around the corridors and you know um, people grew up there and, and, and got to, to, to meet people and, and, and was probably again made friendships for life as well and it was just a, it got an it got a games room with an arcade in it it got a you know it got a it, it was the kind of you, you came off the, off the street and up the stairs and there was the skate shop on the right hand side and you went up the up there and um, 
Oh, a cup of tea's arrived. Look, oh, that's good. That's good. Oh, so excellent. Good. <laughs> um, so um, no, it, it was just it, it just it was a, an old hockey barn, and it was you know I, I remember like the, the you know I remember the old scoreboard. You used to have to climb a great big ladder right behind the goals and the old. The, the clock wasn't digital when I first arrived. The, the clock was um, was a, literally a board with a with a with a round clock on. Um, okay. Set, um, divided to three three sections, and the clock used to tick round, but it had a little a little hand that used to go round. Oh, it was just it was just things that people remember. and 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 I always used to remember when we used to go up to Durham. It was always questionable whether the clock started when the play started. You know, especially particular. It always started on time if they were winning. Um, but oh. if, there was, uh, if, um, if they were losing, just to get the extra, that, that clock never used to start. Well, I'm sure it did. It, it, it did, but it, it didn't feel like it did. But uh, uh, the... no, so I, think, I think it was, um, it, it's hard to explain. And, and the people that, that, that felt that, I mean, I was a bit gutted the last, the last night when the rink was open and people were uh, sort of like taking memorabilia as the place was obviously going to be knocked down. And, um, you know, they, they were people leaving with their seats and they came with screwdrivers and spanners and things like that and, <laughs> and stuff we happened to be i think i was playing away on that day so i was generally quite gutted because you know it would have been nice to have got a little bit of memorabilia but uh, i've got many happy memories of, of, the, of the place and uh, yeah it's um, i'm sure a lot of the, the listeners will um, will also you know be able to put some <laughs> some things in, in the social media links and, and stuff of what the old nottingham ice rink bring oh, back yeah. to them, back to them. So, so Durham had kind of the ice hockey equivalent to Fergie time. Then, whenever they were losing, it just <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, it was, yeah, it was very different. But spent, I can't actually remember now. Thinking it as, as a coach now is how, how I can't remember. We obviously went to an electronic scoreboard at some point in the in the old rink. But I'm just trying to picture now as a kid growing up how to know. I mean, obviously the bench officials were telling people to go on when 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 they'd served their two minute penalties and things like that, but. It was nothing as visual as that, so it's kind of like um, it's a bit, bit, bit yeah. Weird because obviously now you rely so much as a coach on the clock, you know, to to actually give you an idea, especially when it's special teams and 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 heading towards the end of the period, and you might be against it a little bit and and, and whatever. But um, no, it's um, well, I I remember doing the the penalty box at at the Lions, which I know we'll get onto the Lions in some detail later, and. Um, Telford we were playing Telford and they had five in the box and of course you can only in in the in the small ring you can only do two penalties at a time so I was also using my phone to time people at the same time and it all got a little bit on the confusing side it gets, but, very, it gets really confusing doesn't it it gets it gets um yeah it's um, and who should be on the clock who should be off the clock and all that kind of stuff but all a part of the experience Chris all part of the uh, the learning experience yeah do you feel that so the, the new arena now is great, but often again, same with football stadiums where like take when West Ham have moved into the old Olympic stadium, there's just that lost something from when they were at Upton Park and there was talk about like Forest moving at a time and a lot of fans didn't want it. Does the new arena lack a little bit of something? Uh, it's new generation, isn't it? That's the thing. I mean, it's something that Nottingham did need. It did need a new, a new venue. It did need, you know, it needed to be brought into the 20th century and, and, and keep up with the times. Um, but yeah, if you could pick that old rink up and move it somewhere into a, into a, into a local community now, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe without the seats and, and have like almost like a separate training venue, then that would have been, would have been, you know, would have been uh, brilliant. But yeah, it's always tough, isn't it? Because uh, change is always the toughest, isn't it, for for lots of people. It's how you how you deal with that. But I think the thing is that people have many many fond memories, and uh, I think it's it, it's difficult to replicate and get that up close and personal stuff. You know, people if they want to see their favourite players, yeah, they they hang in the in the reception, the foyer area to see their their favourite Panthers player after the game or, or special meet and greet nights and stuff like that. But um, there's nothing. There was nothing better than coming out and seeing some of your favourite Panthers players that have still got steam coming off their heads because they'd just come out of the shower and were going straight for a pint afterwards. And uh, and I think that's what what made you know that kind of up up close and personal stuff is people have many memories. Yeah. So uh, talking about your your playing career then. So you worked your way. When did you get into the junior system? Around eleven. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was maybe. Uh, I'm I'm really bad with dates to be fair, um, but it's but it was, it was a long time ago. Um, but yeah, it was, it was I think it was about eleven or twelve, something along those lines. And and you know, first first team I ended up playing for was the was the Tigers, which was the junior team. Um, 
and um, we had um, again people that put you on the, on the right pathway was my coach was um, Tony McDonald and my um, manager and, and you know driving force for for junior hockey at that time was Gavin Tate who, who unfortunately passed away um, a couple of months ago and um, so yeah there was uh, we, we did a fitting tribute on the um, Nottingham Junior Ice Hockey Club website so if anybody's not seen that if you go to the NIHC website um, you'll uh, see a tribute to a guy that a lot again a lot of people wouldn't have known but uh, that's um, Ashley Tate's dad um, so um, you know God rest his soul kind of thing because Gavin was a, a big driver for many of our, our young players uh, at the time. And so you work, you worked your way up through the system, and then what was Tigers to what, Cougars, Tigers to Cougars, and then it was Cougars to Trojans. Okay. Trojans then became so the Trojans were like the, almost like at the time with the feeder teams, the Panthers. And um, you know, I was just talking to somebody recently that he remembers the old ice rink when we had a junior game. I think it was um, a, 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 a title decider. Um, against Durham and there was something like about 1500 people in there watching um, they filled the place because again the, um, the, the, the hockey um, family as it was then was so close that, that Panthers fans would come down regularly and watch the juniors play and, and, and the rink because of the, the style of the rink made it for that chance to people to come in long bench seats and, and literally in there and, and I remember coming out as a kid and I was like wow what's this all about and we had some really good uh, Trojan games and there was times when there was a Russian team came over as, with the, to watch the Trojans and again big crowds coming in to watch and that was that was great so they could you know see those um, those those players and and you know Obviously, it's, it's very different with there being more imports nowadays. But so, yeah, went through the Trojans and then, yeah, got a chance to, to train with the Panthers at an early age. Again, similar to what we emulate with the, with the Lions now is get if those kids are good enough and they show that passion and desire, bring them up and get them involved and get them training with the senior team. And uh, Damps brought, uh, Alex Dampier brought, brought those players through. And, uh, and yeah, and we, we were battling against each other. And, and it was just like I say, it was part of our growth as, as young players coming into to senior hockey. What was it like for you when you got that? I don't know if it, it was if it was a call or someone just spoke to you and said, "Right, we're gonna, you're gonna get a game icing for the Panthers." I think being from Nottingham, I think that was the biggest thing. You know, I, if I if I had my time again and they said, "Right, you play for the Panthers for nothing," I'd do it because it was the pride, the pride, and the kind of like to represent your county. Really, you know, you're representing your county. Um, and, and you're representing them nationwide. So, you know, um, I was just, it was just so proud to be able to pull on that, pull on that shirt, whether it be once, twice, three times, however many, um, it was just something really special. Yeah. What was, when you stepped on that ice and get, obviously in the, in the old rink and you had all the fans there, what was going through your mind? Was it just don't fall over as you come out of the <laughs> dressing room or? I, I have many, you know, I don't have many, many memories of that, but I just remember, I remember watching, um, when the new imports came in and how excited uh, the fans were. But for me, again, yeah, you, you didn't want to fall over. That was that was one thing nobody wanted to <laughs> fall over. So, I mean, in this day and age, you see, I see coaches now get on the ice because they've got to take the skate guards off and things like that. But no, it was kind of like quite scary. Um, but no, it, but the atmosphere when that building was rocking, it was uh, it was something to, 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 you know, say memories that have last forever, really. Yeah, yeah. And then you went over to the, to the Solihull Barons in, yeah. in so, over there, and your your yeah. playing career was kind of tragically cut short. Yeah, yeah. So I had um, I had a, a, a season and a half in Solly. Oh, a great time, a great time there. What a you know, again a very um, very similar rink to to Nottingham. The crowd very much on top of you, and and you know, with Solly all being a place, you know, there was a place down the the changing room, and it was just the atmosphere, and they're kind of like you know, quite um, intimidating for opposition coming in. It was great to have them on your side. And it was, uh, no, I had, I had a, a season and a half there. I, I went with another player from um, from um, Nottingham, uh, a guy called John Flavel, who, who again, another one of these that's unfortunately <laughs> has, has to, passed away as well. Um, but I had many, many, many times we travelled up the M42. In fact, my dad used to drive us up there so we could get some rest and whatever. So we travelled up there twice a week, training like Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then on the on the weekends, you know, we're playing away, um, traveling. We a lot of the teams initially were down south before the league sort of like changed around a little bit. So we'd travel down to Solihull, jump on the bus, and then when we got home, that twelve o'clock 
early hours of the morning. Maybe another hour up the road, but it was a straightforward journey. Um, yeah, but, yeah. My dad, my dad helped out with the driving and stuff. But yeah, so played with some good players there. Enjoyed that. Um, being a part of that was made to feel very welcome in Solihull. Um, played again with some good players. Um, Steve Chartrand, um, Luke Shabbat were a, a real force in those days, and, and they had John Flavel played on that line. I played most of my time um, uh, at the back with uh, another import, Ian Pound. And um, he, I, learned, I learned such a lot um, from, from that experience. Um, but then, um, so after 18 months of Solio, um, I decided to, well, I didn't decide to move close to home. I moved uh, an hour from home the other way. I, I went and did some work up in Sheffield, but I, I'd, I'd already got, uh, at 17, I'd already got my level one coaching badges and, and, and I was looking to do my level two. And um, started to play in, uh, started to be around Sheffield. I was working with um, a guy called Daryl Eason and um, just started to do some coaching with him. And I ended up coaching a couple of the Sheffield teams. I worked with him with the under 19s at the time. And they're sort of like the equivalent of the Lions in, in those days, but the old um, Queen's Road rink in, in Sheffield. So traveling with Daryl, um, who's now, he, he then went on later to work for the IIHF in their sports development kind of team. And I think now he's currently over in Hungary. Uh, but again, Daryl was uh, was uh, was playing for the Panthers. Um, so there's a lot of links through those junior days of, of, of working with those people as I grew up and um, went and worked with Daryl. But uh, at the time, I, I, I think I, I, I donned the shirt a couple of times uh, for, for Sheffield, but I, I unfortunately took a puck to the back of my leg and um, I didn't really think a great deal about it. And in those days, the padding wasn't the greatest. Like I was saying, it's not, there wasn't a great choice. Um, and um, I, I had a good enough pair of pads, but got hit in exactly the same place in, an, in a game later in the season. And it, it, uh, it formed, I didn't realise, but I went out, I was running, uh, went out running, believe it or not, I used to run in those days when I was younger. Uh, I was running around Collet Country Park and uh, literally had to stop running. I broke down because I, my, I just couldn't run anymore. My, my left leg had inflamed twice the size of the other leg. And I thought, what's this all about? Goes to see the doctor, goes to see the hospital. And I end up with a, a, a blood clot in my left leg uh, around the um, um, calf area, um, which later we found had moved in from the calf to the groin area. And um, literally, um, I was in hospital. I was hosp hospitalised for a couple of weeks. And uh, mum and dad at the side of the bed in tears, both medical people, my mum and dad. And um, I said, well, what, what's the problem? What's wrong? So basically, if the blood clot hadn't stuck where it stuck uh, in your groin and gone to your heart, um, you wouldn't be here, that would have killed you. So um, then I saw, I like, understood how um, how serious it was at the time. Obviously, then I was um, put on um, anticoagulation, you know, warfarin tablets. Um, so those that know it, like rat poisoning to thin my blood, to keep my blood as thin as possible. And and, and in the end, I was warfarin ice for life, you know. So I'm, I'm currently still on warfarin today. And, um, you know, that was pretty much a contact sport, um, an object flying around the ice at speeds 80 90 miles an hour and then somebody that bruises very easy or bleeds very easily it just didn't work out but fortunately um when i was 17 like say 91 i'd got my coaching badges and i was then working with daryl um start to pull together a bit of an idea about my um my coaching my plans for just transitioning across from playing into coaching and uh then I, then I went and worked with another panthers um sort of like hall of famer with the british hockey hall of fame with mike urquhart and I, again, I ended up back down in Solihull again. So I was like to and fro in an hour on my doorstep um, to, again, work with another coach, um, learning the ropes still. So I'd work with Daryl, I'd work with Mike for a few years and then literally start to form my own um, ethos, my own ideas, and, uh, and then came back to Nottingham and then moved the journey further um, through the junior days and, and, um, and, and, and longer back, you know, with the Lions and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's... Uh, keep talking for a long time really Chris but I'll let you ask me another question yeah no I mean you um you'd had based on um what elite prospects were saying anyway you'd had like a point per game, per game year in 91 92 for Solihull um yeah. and I'm, the one thing that jumped out as me um in four it called it qualification I'm guessing like the early playoff games um in four games you had 27 penalty minutes which is kind of not goes against everything I kind of remember about you um and yeah kind of makes me think if you can remember what you did it almost seems as though you had a game misconduct or something uh, well I tried to look at it when you when you sent me the question through I thought I'll try and look at this and I had, I had a quick through but I couldn't actually find the believe it or not I couldn't actually find the extra four games the only thing I could imagine was and I was always taught I was always taught I wasn't a 
I wasn't a, a fighter. I wasn't a trouble causer because I was always. I always remember in the back of my mind from a coach, uh, from a, from from my coaches telling me, "We're not going to win the game sat in the penalty box," you know, and 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 that's what stuck with me through my playing. You know, um, you can antagonise a little bit and have a little bit of a niggle with people, but you aren't going to win the game sat in the penalty box. And I think that's that's what you know. I want to pass. I pass up, pass that on now, really, because it's better to have those five people on the ice as, as much as possible. Uh, the only thing I could picture was. There was a moment, um, but I can't remember if it was the playoffs. I remember we went up to Paisley in Scotland with the Barons and I, I ended up having a disagreement at some point with their import, um, who was Mike Bettins. Uh, I think he played also at Paisley, Telford, a few other places. So I um, had a bit of a disagreement and for some reason, I don't think it, I don't think it ended up in a brawl. I, I, can't, I can't picture it exactly what happened. <laughs> but all I, all I remember was that neither myself or him lasted on the ice. I think, I think I'd gone all the way up to, she- uh, to Scotland for this game. And I think I was on the ice. We were, the game was only about four or five minutes in. So I literally gone all that way. And I think we both got booted out of the game. And you know, I just remember having to like, walk past all the Paisley fans and then go and sit in the crowd, minding my own business to watch the rest of the game. And I think that that's, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was a, it was a disagreement I had with their imports at the time. But to be fair, it probably worked out. I don't know what, what the score was, but I think it was a, a fair swap. Was a, as they'd say nowadays, a, a Brit for an import was it was a good a, a good swap because he was obviously um, quite an impacting person. But I, I can't remember if that was the year when um, I can't remember if Graham Garden played up there from. They used to play for the Panthers, but it was um, yeah. It's um, I wasn't. I don't have many moves. I remember getting booted in the face. I remember. I remember one of the things I do remember because I've still got the scar to to, to me. I remember. <laughs> I remember playing for Soliol in um, in 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 that that season. I was playing against Trafford Metros, which was actually um, the now the Ultra Aces playing out of Manchester, but Trafford Metros at the time. And I remember um, playing against Dan Dorian, who who was again another Panthers player back in um, back in the the the, the late eighties, early nineties. A lot of Nottingham people remember Dan Dorian. I remember getting into a bit of a, a bit of a. I was just trying to not grab a hold of him, but just trying to just basically, you know, separate him from the puck and just we were down in one corner. And we both went to the ice. And I remember as I was getting up um, and he was getting up, I ended up getting kicked in the in the chin with his heel with his blade. And I remember having a great big um, big, big cut in, in my chin. And um, I, I then remember going to see the doctor during the game. It was literally go see the doctor, and he said, right, we're gonna have to stitch this up. And it was literally. Then I have this moment of flashbacks of the old ice hockey film that people remember with Youngblood um, with the doctor doing his, his stitching and his embroidery. And I remember, and all I can still like picture is the, the cord of the, of, the, of the stitching being pulled through my chin um, and, the, and not, feeling, not, not feeling much pain at the time because my adrenaline was pumping around the body. Mm. And, then I, and then I just remember getting back on the bench and, and carrying on playing after about, I think, maybe three or four stitches in the chin. And that was it. So yeah, that's another memory I, I have. So, so. I'm gonna say, so I was going to say that your uh, your coach at the time probably wouldn't like you for getting chucked out four minutes in. But if you took an import with you, then he perhaps uh, wouldn't have minded so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a good, it's a good trade. So you you did your coaching badges young. Were, were you of the mindset at the time of always wanting to go into coaching when you finished playing, or was it more a case of? just wanting to do anything that would get you as much involved in the sport as you could? I think I've got, I think I've got as much enjoyment um, working and, and observing and, and watching. I, I, always, I always like observing and watching other coaches today in, in different sports. And I think at the time, it was just something that appealed to me. And um, I saw that, you know, that Daryl and Mike in particular, not necessarily made great careers out of it, but just had some great, well, they, they've had a good, good, good innings in the sport. And I, I just think I just, something that really just, took my attention and I, I wanted to try and follow. So in, um, and it was, when it was the, um, the coaching program at the time, um, it was um, BIHA, I think it was um, at the time, but, but the, the coaches that were delivering it were also, um, uh, you know, some, some coaches that you looked up to. So there was the person that delivered my course was Mike Sirant, who was based at the time in Milton Keynes. And um, so he was, he was part of my level one. And then, um, so again, just huge amounts of experience from, from college hockey um, in, in Canada and America. And um, then when I did my level two, it was uh, Peter Woods, who was also down in Basingstoke. And he also had a spell coaching the Panthers as well. So people, again, that, you know, I was, I think I was keen to, to volunteer and, and be a part of the game and, and, and learn and, and, and just gain some experience. 
Um, and then I did my level three in 2000 over in Sheffield. And um, that was, again, an amazing experience. It was a, it was a, it was a tough, tough time, you know, because you had to, it, was a, it took me about 18 months to do the exam and all that kind of the stuff that went with it. And we, we, we stayed up in Sheffield for, for a whole week and did the course. And there were some great speakers on there. And um, one of the coaches that was speaking on there was also a former coach of the Steelers was Don McKee. And um, they had some really good guest speakers in as well. And, uh, you know, I, uh, that was it pretty much. So I, I got my level three out of the way with as well in 2000. And um, no, I just, I was just keen to uh, pass on any experience, but also learn a lot of experience. I think it was learning the, the first, the first 10 years was about learning, 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 taking as much on board as I possibly can. And um, I remember going to, um, I, I did some work with the, 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 the coaching program um, myself. I was helping out with some of the courses and whatever. And we, we ended up going to a, um, um, a coaching uh, symposium over at, um, we ended up going to Switzerland in oh, okay. again, 2000. And uh, when we went to Switzerland, um, we ended up, it was the under twenties world championships, April at the time. Um, but we ended up staying on site. And uh, I always remember my, one of my biggest things that I remember um, again, and again, I take this and I, I try and pass this on to people is um, in, in Nottingham with the coaching is that um, it's, he said it was a, a guy called Pierre Paget, who was the, one of the head scouts for, at the time, I think it was um, Minnesota or yeah, the Minnesota uh, team in the NHL. Um, and if you look him up on elite prospects, he's had a huge career with the NHL as a coach further down the line. And he said, you're always on your way to becoming a great coach. Um, so actually, what he's saying there is you're learning every day. You're always on your on that journey and you never become the finished article. And I think that's what I always take away is I will always go to a, a session, whether it, like I say, whether it's a multi-sport session, whether it's football, cricket, and I'm watching how other coaches operate. I just really enjoy watching and, and trying to, to learn from them, but also then passing any knowledge or, or stuff onto the uh, junior coaches in Nottingham um, to this day. So what is your kind of ethos as being a coach? Because if anybody, um, anybody who's not familiar, uh, Matt is the, the coach of the Nottingham Lions, has been for nearly a decade now, and I'm going into, if we can get on the ice at all this season, my fourth season um, with the Lions as part of the media team. And for anyone who does kind of know about the Lions, the win percentage is not that high. <laughs> um, but I think, as you will agree, the win percentage, particularly with the Lions squad, is is not the point of it for those young players, is it? No, it's not. No, it's um, it's clearly not win at all costs. Um, it's not not my ethos. Um, it's to it's to offer a platform to um, young up and coming players that want to um, you know push their push their we could say careers. It, it's hard, isn't it? Because I I say to players in, in this day and age now is to do your schooling do your college, do your apprenticeship, do your university, do your thing. But most of all, enjoy your hockey and enjoy your sports and enjoy your, your teammates and your friends and, and, and your experiences. I think what the hockey can offer you now is your life experiences. And I still, um, when I bump in and I speak to some of the players that played in the past with the Lions back in the early 2000s, you know, I remember a couple of young players in particular would say, um, a guy called Steph Dodwell, and he said, you know what, um, they were the best days of my sporting life, you know, and, and those are the memories and those those people that they met along the way and and, and, and that. I think that, so, so it's great those memories, but it's also, it's trying to put um, the right, you know, getting these young people playing at the highest level they possibly can, because they, they may never play in the Elite League, they may never play overseas and, and abroad, but do you know what, if they can be local lads and we can offer that opportunity to them, um, I just really enjoy um, working with the junior club at the moment and, and seeing these young players coming through, um, but also um, seeing the, 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 the roller coasters as, as the kids grow up and they, as they grow, their skating styles change, their, their attitudes change, you know, sometimes for, for the worse and sometimes for the better, but, but that's part of them growing up. And um, I like to um, keep a real close eye on, 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 on players, on, on how they do progress, 
And then we give them that opportunity when they get to, to 16 and they're eligible to play senior hockey and train with, with the team. We put them in positions and, and, uh, that, that we, 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 we know that they can deal with and cope with. But then sometimes we try and think with some of them, we can push them to another level. So picking three or four 18s B players last season was a, was a bit of a highlight and, and then getting some of those guys involved that probably wouldn't think they'd even get a, a sniff at playing for the senior team. Um, and, and working with some of these young up and coming players, to we've put many a player onto onto a, onto the platform to to play get uh, to play at the highest level possible. And then teams have taken them; they have been snapped up, they have gone elsewhere. You know, Oli Betridge came through the, the junior program. Robert Lakovic came through the program, and there's, there's the list is as long as your arm that are still playing in the EPL in places like Peterborough and Telford, and you know Sam Gospel and and, and Sam Bullis down at Swindon and. And, you know, Will, Will Weldon and, and Thomas Saw and, and Bowley and, and, and Joe Graham and James Neal. It, the list is endless. You know, Jack Prince's and, and, and it just on and on and on. And, it's, and I think that's what makes me proud because we still then have that connect with those players to this day. Um, they, they, you know, and I think that they're, they, they're like our, our flagship. There's, there's people out there that are still, you know, if, if they want a bit of advice, they'll still come to us. And if we want a bit of help, we'll go to them. You know, Tom Norton, another great mm. Yeah. Go through the team ranks, you know, and I just hope one day as well that when they do get to the end of their sort of like um, their sort of like paid playing days and 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 their lives change with maybe children on the way or whatever might happen is they might just come back and you know Mark Leavers is another example. I just keep thinking of mm. things now is yeah. that they will <laughs> come back and maybe give us a season, give us a season or two maybe or some support around say those lines and I think that's what. If anything, if we if we can if we could put in another another four or five really experienced players like like those we've spoken about, you know, we wouldn't be far off, and our and our win percentage would be a lot higher. And um, we'd you know we'd we you know we'd, our players are getting stronger and smarter. I mean, only just during the lockdown period, just going back and seeing some of the players now um, that, that that I've not seen since March time, and uh, they've got bigger, they've got stronger, they're getting quicker, and. You know, if we could fast forward to another three years and they're still playing and they've had five, six, seven years of experience playing senior hockey and they get to, and I can manage to, you know, keep their, keep them, you know, excited and playing their hockey and loving their hockey, then um, that's a, that's a great job that we've done as, as the coaching staff and um, just, um, just being able to do that would be, um, would be great. And I think then we'll really see more benefits of the work. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a five, six, seven year program really when you think about it I think that's kind of a, a key thing really is that you probably judge your success as a coach more on the, all those players that you said that you know you have helped develop throughout um, their childhood and throughout the Nottingham junior system that have gone on to feature for elite league sides Great Britain and that is probably how you measure your success much more than the position in the league table absolutely um I've just started doing some work recently, um, and I know we'll probably touch on it a bit. But I've been doing some off-ice work with some some with the kids from Nottingham Junior Hockey Club, and uh, and just uh, just something I saw. I've seen a, I've seen a, a player recently that's um, he plays for our under-18s team. He's um, the good thing about the junior development is um, uh, the playing um, three three years at under-18 level is is phenomenal, and um, so much can happen in those years um, between the age of 15 and 18. And then we're fortunate enough as well because we've got an under twenties team as well that I've come across another player recently that's got amazing hands. Um, he loves the sport. He plays ball hockey, and he's fit as a butcher's dog. Do you know what I mean? He's he's he's, he's a fit kid. But I also seeing those kids in in different environments. Um, maybe not the best skater, um, an above average skater that we can push on more. Um, but you can see his his mindset and his uh, his effort and his commitment and and um, he, he, he just his work rate. Now, if we could get that, and we will get him on the ice. I've already spoken to the kid, and we'll get him on the ice. We'll earmark him already for well, it would have been for this season, but you know, we'll, mm. you know, more likely going to be for next season. But if we can get him into the ranks and playing with us, then he's going to have to push his game further with his skating, which means his skating is going to improve more. But he's got something about him. I'm looking for those players that got something about them, and and. And, and that's where it is, that great platform to be able to work in and amongst these players on a regular basis, even more regular uh, now, um, mm. because of the circumstances and, and situation we'll talk about shortly. But 
you know, it, it's, 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 it's great. And, and, and that's where I get my, I suppose I get, get my enjoyment and, and the buzz of seeing these players develop and, and pull on the Lions shirt and, and go and play in a, in a place like Whitley Bay in front of eight, 900 fans that, that, you know, they want to see their home team win and, and, and then they play hard and there's some big men in there and, and that's all part of the learning. But what's also been amazing is to see the, the appreciation um, that's shown for a team that, that can go, you know, pretty much a whole season without winning a game, but can actually then say, you know, did we, did we improve? Is there areas for improvement? Yeah, of course, there's always areas to improve. But, what, you know, are we, are, we, are we starting to compete more in certain areas of the game? And just, you know, just seeing the appreciation when we leave places now like Whitley Bay and Billingham. And if you get that kind of applause and that standard ovation, then to me, the boys and the team and the people behind the scenes uh, should be very proud. I think that's when we look at the game sheets from, from Lions fixtures and of the 15 skaters that, that you put on the ice, you're talking eight, nine, ten of them are, are under 18 and in the junior system. And then it's just bolstered with the likes of Luke Thomas, who sits on the penalty box more than anybody else because he loses his call quite a bit. And, and Ben Wills. He likes to go for a rest. And, and, and Ben Wilson, that likes. But it is predominantly the, the junior setup. And you come up against sides who maybe have like one junior. In, in the whole squad and you're up there with, with eight, nine, ten of them. And then as you said, it's it's the progression. So maybe in the first game of the season you lose kind of eight one, but then in the second game it's four one. And that is that growing. And you and I know you've said before that when they go back then into their own age group, they're just completely dominant. Yeah, the thing that I think the thing that gutted, gutted us all this year within the club would have been um going to the end of the season, so sort of like eighteens and under twenties and not being able to go to the playoffs and showcase mm. the players that we've been working with because, you know, they're, they're, they're some solid, solid players. And as a unit and as a team, you know, they've, they've been dominating the 18s and 20s scene. So I think if that's probably anything that's probably been a bit of a disappointment to not being able for them to fulfil the season and being able to, to show that work we're doing. But, you know, we're, we're already putting plans in place now. We're working hard um, now within the juniors and um, Nottingham Junior Ice Hockey Club's in a, in a good place. And um, there's some some great people behind the scenes, and uh, and they're very passionate to see that the the, the, the club succeed. So um, yeah, it's um, it's signs are very good. How do you, as a as a coach, kind of manage all of the different kind of personalities and mindsets on the bench? So I know you work very closely with uh, Paul Glossop with the Lions, and you have the mentality of talking to people and mapping everything out. And he has the mentality with his flat cap on of screaming from one end of the bench to the other side of the ice. And particularly when I've, when I've watched training as well, there's two very different styles. How do you kind of cope with uh, and managing some players who are obviously there for the fun of it, but then there's some players who perhaps have a bit of an ego, the younger players who think they're all this. Well, it's clearly with gloss, it's all a front, isn't it? You know, he's a <laughs> friendly guy. Um, I, I try and be a bit more, um, a bit more quiet, a bit more. You know, we, we play good cop, bad cop. Most most coaching staff will do that. There's a lot of the players and, and the juniors. Um, Gloss likes to be around, and 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 they will come to him, and, and they will speak to him, and 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 then me and Gloss have worked together for a number of years, and um, I think that's that's the great thing. I've known him, I've known him for a long time. He he watched the Panthers play and and saw the similar development. He watched in the years when I was playing and the juniors, you know, and that, that kind of, that kind of eighties, nineties gloss was a, was a big follower of the sport and he's been around the game a long time. His kids have both come through the junior program and played through, through the junior club up to the senior level. And, um, you know, he still puts a huge amount of time in and he's, he's working tirelessly with the, with the coaches at Nottingham and, and as the head coach of the junior club. And um, we put things in place to be able to, to, the thing that's very unique now, and I think with Nottingham now, is our under nines work solidly right the way through to the Lions. And I think it's, it's pretty seamless now. The communication, the support network that we all offer each other as coaches, and I think that's, that's the, probably the most unique um, thing about us. Um, you know, if somebody can't make something or do something, then somebody will fill in. But they won't just fill in with their own agenda. They work very much, very closely together. And I think... That's probably been an amazing plus through the lockdown period because we have kept in contact and we we speak on a, you know, 
well, I'll say on an hourly basis, that would be a lie because there's literally there's text going around every minute, every minute of every day. Um, but some of it's fun, some of it's, um, you know, keeps us going on the day day to day. But also, it's also showed some some real strength um, for people that might be having some some tough times. So um, I think that unity has been very important. Um, what was the original question? I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of how do you. Um kind of cope with different personalities yeah. on the bench yeah. and making it's them all still, gel? Every player is very different. Some will react very differently. Some, some need the arm around the shoulder. Some need the kick up the ass. Um, some I try and get a response out of because I know that they're not performing to their, the best of their ability. And if that means them coming back to say, see, coach, I told you I could do it. And I, you know, up yours, basically. You know, but that's what I get, try and get the best out of those mm. players because it's, it's, every day is a challenge with them, um, working with them, training and stuff. But I think because they because they train 18s, 20s, and Lions, um, and together as a as a as a as a cohort, but then they also train in their own in their own teams as well. I think that that really complements it because then players that are looking up to other players and, and might be better players than say a, a Luke Thomas, but Luke Thomas has got a lot of experience to, to mm-hmm. offer them back and try and keep them on the straight and narrow as well. So there is things that that they offer um, and, and bring to the team to make it very rounded. And if it wasn't for those committed players that like I say aren't necessarily the best players in the team, but they're the best team players. Um, you know, you, you've got to have the right room um, to make this a success. And, and we try and look for the right, for the right personnel to, to, to support the, uh, the development of those players. I have a bit of a, a probing question for you now, then it might make you think a little bit. Who's the best player that you played with and the best player that you coached? So the best player I played with, um, I think, has to be back when um, I was around the Panthers was a guy called Terry Curtinback. Um, he played number nine. He was a bit of a, um idol for, for most um, young women uh, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite smooth. He was smooth on the ice. I don't remember him off the ice because I was mainly focused on what he was doing on the ice. But for me... He was cool, he was calm, he was collected. Um, he, again, didn't take many penalties. He wasn't a big defenceman, but he was a solid defenceman. He did all the simple things right. And if anything, he, 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 used, the, he used his energy wisely. And um, he, he saw the whole ice and he, was, he, could, he could thread a pass, he could shoot from the point. And he was um, a, a great role model. Um, and in, in that same area, uh, sorry, in that same era would have been uh, Paul Aidy. Mm-hmm. Um, who have been uh, linked up again recently? Um, again, his work rate, uh, his work rate on the ice, uh, off the ice, looking after himself. Um, you know, really, you know, he had to, he had to stand up for himself. He was a small guy. He had to scrap a bit when he first came in um, to, to to give himself some space on the ice. But he was the the top. Um, he's been the top Panthers goal scorer in, in the history of the game, and um, he's a experience and expertise and, and stuff was something as a, as a young person you'd look up to so hard to name one but I'd go probably Curtin back and AD would be my two that I looked up to as a, as a, as a player. Yeah and what about players that you've coached is there any that even at a really young age you thought oh, this player is going to be something quite special or? Yeah I mean Working with, uh, I suppose, you know, the, the, the two, you know, the, I didn't do lots of close work with Lakovic, but, but having him around with the Great Britain programme, with the universities programme um, was great. Just having him around, his experience and, 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 the, and, the, and the World Student Games really pushed his game back in 2009. Um, I suppose working closely with Ollie Betridge was, was, was great to, to see him um, go from strength to strength. Before that was Mark Leavers, again, putting him on that mm-hmm. platform. Um, so good players that we've coached again end up with the Panthers and Belfast Giants and around the GB program as well. Um, more recently, I've worked with a guy um, at the most recent World Student Games in 2019, a player that I just liked and, and worked with was um, not, not many people again would know him, but a guy called Josh Cook who came into the GB program. He's over, I think, in the States, um, but something about his game I really liked um, that basically took us through a long tournament in 2019 and something that, that you know, his, his tenacity and his winding a few opposition up, but also playing the game hard. And like I say, he wasn't the greatest player, but he was the hardest worker and he was the best team player and, and things like that. So this is, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few along the way, but, but, but more, more closer to home would have been the, the few I've mentioned working with probably Ollie the most and uh, 
trying to give him some advice and support on you know, when to make that jump and is it too early, is it too late? And, and that's, that's what I say, whereas, whereas somebody like Ollie went quite early um, down to Swindon. Um, Lacko hung around the junior and completed his junior days and, and, and also was on like a two-way deal. Um, he started training with the Panthers. He was on a two-way, but he was still playing with the Lions um, back, in the, back in those days. And, and he was also on a two-way with Manchester. So he, he developed very differently. Um, but again, different, different eras, really, when you, when you think about it. Um, difference in, in age, you know, between Oli and, and, and Lacko. But both Lacko's had a very successful um, career and, and a GB career and, and you know, represented at every level and at senior level for, for a long time as well. Um, and, and Ollie's still on that, on that upward, upward spike to, to, to he's got so much to offer. Um, he's a good kid. He's a nice kid. You can always drop him a text and drop a line saying, you know, what about this and what about that? And would you help out with this? And, you know, you know, I think, I think that's, that's really great. Mm. So you mentioned the, the GB university squad, you've been coached for, 14 odd years now um, there. What's, what are the main differences between doing like a university squad where they come together pretty much for the tournament and then, for example, the Lions where they're the same players every week? It must present its own challenges. Yeah, so um, planning to go to a World Student Games playing against um, top nations in the world was just something that I was... Um, part of from 2006 um, we start I started working with Simon Hopkins um, who was heading up the university's program and he and he you know headed up for, for all those years and uh, myself and Mike Urquhart um, started coaching and looking to, to pull together a Great Britain team and uh, then the sort of like the, the early dream was to go to the World Student Games the, the Winter University had and uh, you know I, it was just such a we didn't know much about the tournament. We knew it was a world, we, we researched it and we knew it was such a world-class tournament, but just bringing a, a team together, preparing probably 12 months ahead or sometimes longer ahead and then trying to repeat that plan for the following, you know, every two years when, when the games took place. Um, it, it, you don't, you know the players, but you, you don't know them, you know of them, you, you speak to other coaches and you then just got to start looking at how they gel when it came together, and um, and really start to try and formulate a bit of a plan on you know your, your team makeup of your number of D you're going to take, the number of forwards you're going to take, what you might need during that tournament, and not necessarily always the best player or the, the superstar player that you always need. You need that kind of team um, camaraderie when you're you're in a tough position playing against some world class you know competition, the top class competition. I've I've ever coached against, you know, players that have been drafted in the NHL, um, playing for the for the Czech, you know, for the Czech Republic, and you know, a couple of guys were drafted to Boston Bruins, a couple of people in the Toronto Maple Leafs from the Canadian team, and just that kind of, you know, what I'd always use the analogy would be um, um, these hockey players that just happen to go to university, where we were, we were very much made of university students that happen to play a bit of ice hockey. And, uh, and that's what you were pitting your, your wits against. Um, and again, I suppose it was that it was it's been a, it was a long journey. Um, we've been to some amazing places and seen some amazing um, organised world class events. And you know, from two thousand and seven um, in, in in Torino or Turin um, to be the two thousand and six Winter Olympics were held there, and we stayed on site in the accommodation, just get a feel for the. Um, the size and the you know, this this kind of competition and being part of it wasn't just about going to an ice hockey tournament. You were there representing Great Britain as a team, and that would have been you know your figure skaters, your speed skaters, your 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 you know skiers, your you know all these kind of the curling team. And if it was your day off, you didn't really get a day off because you'd either go and train or mm-hmm. or, or you support one of the other teams that were competing because it was about you know that unity uh, of, of the, the 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 Great Britain team and walking onto that opening ceremonies in, in these, um, you know, these, these, it was the, win- it was the student Olympics in theory, winter Olympics. Uh, and that's how big a, how big a competition it was. And just, um, you know, um, we, we were in uh, Torino in 2006, we were in Harbin in China in 2009. Um, but then to, to try and grow the um, wealth of experience in, in those teams, you know, in the early days in, in 2000 and t- in 2007, you, you know, we just happened to get like one, one top 
one of one of particular top players that comes to mind was a guy called Ben Campbell who who played in the elite league both with Guildford and 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 and, and Newcastle and up 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 north and and also more recently playing in our league uh, for for Whitley Bay and you know a, a top top player you know um, so he was part of the program and then the following you know cycle into two thousand nine in Harbin was to try and pull together more depth in your in your lineup and that's when again. We ended up with goaltenders like Jeff Woolhouse and and and, and, mm. and Steve, Stephen Phone, and that's again where um, where Lakovic, where Rob Lakovic and Tom Norton came into the into the equation. So it was a kind of like trying to really uh, raise the profile of this competition to sell to people of how amazing this opportunity was going to be as part of their because obviously you had to be a student and, and qualify. Yeah. I'm assuming you couldn't just pick anybody. You had to be at a certain level within your within your study. Um, so again, that was always quite quite tough because you were almost waiting to see well who's going to uni this year and try and put the word out and put trials out and try and bring those players together. Um, 2013, we ended up in in Trentino in Italy. Um, 2017, we're in Kazakhstan. But you know, up until up until so the first three games from 2007. 2009, 2013, we'd still not won a game. So, um, but but again, what we were doing was we were learning what we needed to do to to finish. The main aim was always to try and finish in the top ten. Who's normally a every the, every every top competition was around 12, 14 teams in it, and the main aim was to to try and finish top ten to be able to qualify for the next games automatically without having to wait to see what teams would go in before you could actually qualify. So, so like. The rules were at the time were, were, were top ten finish and you're guaranteed a place. Right. Um, so I was about to ask if there was any kind of qualification yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. So. So, so every year, so 2007, we then have to wait because we didn't finish in the top ten. We'd have to wait to see whether we were we were able to go and whether funding was there and, and how it worked out to, to whether we could qualify for the next games and. So after those first three games, we, 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 we took better teams and better, when I say better teams, as in better players, but we knew exactly what we needed. Uh, we knew what the level of competition was. We knew that actually that by the time we got towards the end of a tournament, we needed to be in a, um, you know, in a position where physically and mentally we were still in the, we were still in it as in like we were still able to compete when it came down to the placing games. So when it came to the, to, to the, to the, to the games that were going to decide whether you could get to the top 10 or, or whatever, then you know, were we st- were we di- were our bodies as players were were we still intact? Could we still deal with it? You know, from the from the some of the we had some quite big beatings off some of the top teams that that took no pity in, in basically you know beating you quite heavily because it was all about sometimes goals scored um, dependent jockey in the positions when they were going through to the quarters and the semis mm. and through to the final stages, um, but just the experience and the opportunity to play against those will be something again that can't be taken away from those players and I'm sure if you you ask people like Laco and Norton today they will still have so many memories of the trip to, to China um, oh, I bet they will yeah yeah and, and so so the first win came in 2017 in Almaty in Kazakhstan and then um, with that gave us a top 10 finish we we beat um, Korea um, in our final game, which was basically, so you played your round robin games, and then it was a case of then playing like um, your your placing games, and, and we we beat Korea three um, one, I believe, and uh, that was again was just the greatest feeling because actually, if you looked at it in the number of games that you played to get that win, it was something like probably about I don't know eighteen games to get the win. I can but say, what was that feeling like? Because you've been working on this for so, yeah. so long. Yeah. So I bet you, you were... It, yeah, if you took it in number of games, it was like 18 games. But actually, the first <laughs> win didn't come for like 10 years. Yeah. So like, if you looked at it over the years, um, it, was, it was something special. Um, I bet you were there just watching the clock tick down. It's like, oh, we're doing it, we're doing it. <laughs> I think if anything, it was just celebrating with the people on the bench behind the scenes. You know, Simon, um, Andy Marshall and Mike. Um, in fact, I don't know if Mike was there actually on the first win. So he put all that time in, but he, he wasn't with <laughs> he wasn't with us during that time. I don't believe. And uh, but it was just it was just a great feeling and uh, something again you you'll, you'll remember for the rest of your life. And uh, just the journey we, we were on to get to get that far. And then yeah. uh, then so we got tenth tenth place, and then we were on to um, Krasnyarsk in um, in in Siberia in Russia. And again, they they ended up having to move the games to sort of like March time because it's normally instead of January, February, it's just too cold. 
too cold for a winter game. <laughs> too, too cold for a sport with ice. <laughs> yeah, it was too cold. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, we managed to, to again to, to 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 get ourselves through the uh, get ourselves through the 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 early rounds and the early games playing against again the Canadas and the um, I think we played against the the, the Swiss this time and and and, and Latvia and some some really good nations. Um, Kazakhstan themselves and uh, we ended up playing um, we got through and we played Sweden um, and, and we, 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 we beat Sweden I think Sweden totally fancied their chances and um, we just everything came together at the right <laughs> place at the right time and we had some really good leaders on the day we had some sound yeah. goaltending on the day um, as, a, as a coach I had to make some real tough tough decisions and um, I actually ended up playing in that game. I ended up playing my third choice goalie for that game, and it could have been really egg on the face time. But actually, he was possibly in the in the best place and the most focused place at the time. And uh, it just, you know, I took a huge risk as a coach, and uh, it paid off. Cause it, it paid off. Up. So it looked like a genius move. Yeah, it did. Yeah, and, and, and that was um, Josh Crane who was with us last season. Oh and, yeah. So so that was a that was an absolute uh, great feeling for him. Great feeling that that the plan worked and a great feeling the team that we'd we'd beaten this Swedish team that that we got some quick goals we got we got ahead early and then they it was they put us under the cosh because I think they eventually woke up and thought these guys mean business and they put us under the cosh and and and, and, we, and we 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 got through by the seat of our pants but yeah, that was probably just one of the most amazing moments as well mm. so yeah, yeah many amazing many <laughs> amazing moments really You've you've been fortunate to go to so many places, as you said. What's the best arena that you've been to with the with the GB Uni squad? It's got to be um, the, the two most recent ones. I was just thinking about that question. You know, what was um, Krasnyarsk in Russia? Um, the amount of funding and money got put into that was phenomenal. Um, these 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 rinks are built brand new, purpose built rinks specifically for that competition. So you were going into um, twin pad facilities um, that had actually got, you know, a, a major game going on and there's practices going off in other rinks, but you got it all to, it was all about the hockey, the 12 to 16 teams were all based in where with, with the changing rooms and the organization operation. And, and just the fact that, you know, it just shows that the, the height of this kind of competition, the level of this competition, when you've got Vladimir Putin attending the opening ceremony, you can just imagine how, the standards he would want to see representing his country to actually, you, you can just, you just imagine the opening ceremony yeah. what like and what the, you know, what the whole kind of organization and the, the funding that had gone into it to make this happen was just out of this world and something I'll, <laughs> I'll never probably sample again. Um, but, but, but I have, and, and, and it makes me feel very proud to, to have been a part of that. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that was probably, so it, from the rink's perspective, it was probably Krasnyarsk or, or Almaty in Kazakhstan. Um, they filled the place. They filled the place with, no matter what game it was, whether it was us against the Canada team or obviously the big games were the Russia, the Canadas, the, the, the America, Russia, or, or those kind of huge games. Yeah. You would have thought that not many people would turn up to the, to the, sort of like the lower rank, the early games. But they didn't. They brought in local communities and local people, and actually, with they they supplied them with things like GB flags and, and stuff to make them feel part. And they they picked a team and they supported it, and 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 just the atmosphere in there was was just absolutely um, something again to 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 just remember. Um, just I remember the first time the players, some of the players, played with a video board, a live video board, a live video stream that might have been, that been going out. Some of the, a couple of the games were on Eurosport um, many years ago. And just the fact that, that those, those players will never, and as, I mean, as a coach, would never have seen it. And you, you, they actually, you know, they were just bamboozled by the fact they'd got a live <laughs> video. So actually there was replays coming on it. So actually when there was a goal or when there was a play or something had happened or they'd done something good, they'd look up and they'd be like, almost like in awe that their face and their, they were on <laughs> the It was just, again, something again that they, they yeah. That, it's just amazing, and uh, so yeah, for me, the, the two main rinks were the, the two the two rinks in in Krasnyarsk in in, in, in and Almaty, um, just brand new facilities, and 
got many a photograph and many a, a video clip that I just look back on from time to time and just 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 think, wow, what what, what memories? Yeah. So let's um, just fast forward to today. Then you're you're wearing a, a Matt Bradbury Sports uh, hoodie, getting some branding out there. Um, you've you've started a new a new venture in your own business. Yeah, you, know, you would have thought you'd try and start your own business in a lockdown coronavirus pandemic. You know, <laughs> as as all rinks at the moment are are suffering, and uh, businesses, hospitality, arenas everywhere across the whole economy and, and people in their, 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 their lives um, and families and, and, you know, some very, very sad times um, since we last spoke in, in March when we, when, we, when we spoke at the last Lions game and um, what was it, about eight months ago. Yeah. So, much, so much has happened in everybody's personal lives and, and I, was, um, I was, my job was put at risk at the arena after 18 years and, um, and I, I, I just thought, you know, this might be an opportunity to really um, go for it. And, and rather than dwell on, on negativity, just try and be positive and upbeat about, about my future and, and, and where I want to go and what, I, what I'd like to achieve. And, you know, if this, this I, I've got to use this as a positive opportunity. I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I'm, I'm energetic. I've worked across um, communities and schools and run a huge ice skating program that's engaged 30,000 children in the last say 14 years and um, which will have impacted on many people's lives in, in local communities and some of these young people now would hopefully then bring their children back to ice skating and ice sports and and and, 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 and doing something different rather than just just the, the, the mainstream sports because um, just because it might have given them just a, that real boost that they needed. And I, I worked closely with, with schools and I, I devised like a, a hockey, a street hockey um, program that, that was working across the schools. And um, I thought, why not, why not give it a go myself? And um, that's, that's what really um, sort of like inspired me to, uh, to, to take a tough decision um, from a tough position um, to actually work for myself. And, you know, um, I could have easily called my company XL Sports or, or whatever. I might have made up a name, but with the with, with the work that I've done and the reputation I've got across the schools and in the communities, it made sense to go with my name just to try and get branded up. And um, I recently, I, I'm well, I'm, I'm currently, I mean, it's half term at the moment, but I'm currently working in uh, in a couple of uh, well, one particular infant school. So I'm delivering um, PE and sports and and and. and multi-sport but in particular I've more recently I've done some hockey skills with with the uh, year one and year two with five and six year olds um at a school um an infant school over in Toten um and then I work um I'm only doing a couple of days a week at the moment because again schools are very um very tough environments for what's with what's going off for the the whole change that's had to occur within schools with the bubbles and the you know the trying to keep you know everything healthy and clean and sterile and, and all that kind of stuff and, and, and doing what's right for the, for, for the safety of the kids and, 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 and families and you know, yeah. the country. It's, um, I, I, I then now work as well on, a, on an afternoon with a couple of other primary schools. Um, and I'm just, just working at trying to grow that business a little bit more. Um, but again, during these tough times, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Um, but on my website, I wrote um, a feeling, which was my first day back coaching, and I, I headlined it, great to be back. And what was very apparent was going back into the schools after, you know, a total lockdown and, and going back into the schools. And was the one thing that hadn't changed was the, the passion that there was for sport um, in particular. So that's one thing that the virus didn't beat. There is still a huge passion out there for sport in general. Um, and kids wanting to play sport and being motivated by sport and also the fact that um, the teachers are absolute working their socks off to make it you know the, the, the making children still want to go to school and, and and during these tough times and 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 that kind of drive from the schools is still there as well and that that's what really just I want to build on that and um, I've got a couple more things lined up hopefully in, in the future but to um um, to deal with that during this time has been has, has, has been has been tough, but it's also been um, 
it's very enlightening and I'm, I'm really excited um, to, to, take, to take Mount Bradbury Sports further. I've got some more schools lined up to deliver with, um, but I'm also looking to, to link up. I'm doing some link-up work with the, the Nottingham Club. Uh, like I say, we've been running some off-ice activities as well. Um, so yeah, so it's um, it's exciting times. Exciting times um, as we as none of us really know what's around the corner, which is probably the toughest. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited by it, and it's something that you know if if I look back, you know, if I'd have been in the position where I am and look back and think, well, at least I'm giving it a go, and it could be something that you know works really well, and uh, hopefully I can pass on my experience and enthusiasm and love for developing um, sport and children and young adults. And um, we can help raise that kind of self-esteem and keep the energy going throughout um, the work I'm doing um, in the schools. Yeah, best of luck to you. Um, we've gone through pretty much your entire ice hockey career up to today. Um, just, just finally, final question, um, looking into the future. What do you think that the future holds for, for Great Britain ice hockey? We're seeing a lot of youngsters, as you know, there's obviously potential for the Great Britain national team in the World Championship. Uh, again what do you think the future for great british ice hockey is well, i think the most important thing is that we're able to get back into back onto the ice and, and get people back into arenas but you know that's a 64 million dollar question as to what point that will be <laughs> yeah um i think that's that's the first thing um future's bright i think in, and, it, and it was really bright where we were at back if we were to rewind the clock back into march you know um the great britain national programs well, it's clear it's in the best place it's ever been. Um, and people behind the scenes and the effort and the work and the commitment that's going off, everybody should be very proud with, with you know, I, I never expected to be, to see my own nation where it is sort of like today or, you know, where, where it is and it, and it still is at, at the top April, an April nation. And who would have thought we could ever say that? Um, so, you know, we must be doing something right as a as a nation. I think we've got to just stay committed to the sport as volunteers, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a paid paid professional. Um, but I think it's again, it's just to keep that growth mindset and grow um, the way we deliver. Not not just be pigeonholed and stick to the way that we're just. That's how we used to do it. So that's the way we're always going to do it. I think we've got you've got to step out of that and you've got to. You've got to look to try and keep up with the times and, you know, have a look across the seas and see what some of these other nations are doing um, because the, the top nations are doing something a little bit different. Yeah, you could say, well, it's all about funding. It's all about money. But sometimes you've got to, you've got to look by that. and You've got to, kids have got to be young, up and coming kids that have got potential need to be playing the game and need to be, you know, you, you, they need um, game time game time to be able to play on the PP, the short, the short and uh, everything. They've got to experience the sport and, um, and um, but no, they, but, but I'm just so, so proud to, to where they are. And I just hope that we can come back out the other end and, 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 and build on the work that's already been set up um, because it took a long time to get there. And um, there's been a lot of blood, sweat and tears and um, it's just, harsh to be taken away um you know the, the momentum was good the momentum was strong i mean you know who'd have thought we had that game lined up where canada were going to come as part of the pre-world championships to come and play in nottingham uh, for all yeah. to see both and myself and hayden had tickets for that i know and i did as well i was um, you know um it, 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 that would have been a pinnacle to be able to have seen that in you in in, in your own country to, to see it happen on as part of their preparation, their final preps, they would have been bringing, um, you know, the best squad, the best team mm. with them. Um, you would have seen some, some amazing hockey. And, and again, one of those memories you'd have had for, for a long, long time. Um, but no, the hockey's in a, the, the hockey's in a good place. Just got to keep that energy and enthusiasm and keep learning. Um, coaches, myself, I, I want to keep learning. And, um, and I think that that's the big, that's the big thing for me. Um, just keep going for it when the time allows it when we're allowed to get back on the ice and do what we do um at that level with with, with the with the senior team through the the junior gb teams as well just you know there's no doubt that that we will be able to get it going again as a, as a nation um but i think you've got to believe in it and you've got to you've got to keep working it
Yeah, and I'm certainly looking forward to uh, standing next to the cold rink in Nottingham with a microphone in my hand for the uh, for the next Lions game, and then having the the post match interview with you again uh, after when I, back, when I go back down again, Chris. What I do is I'll just have a, I'll take a bit of polish down. I'll give it a quick your seat, your area. I'll give it a quick, <laughs> give it a quick clean up just and. Uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it, it's really sad, but um, it will come again, and um, it's just yeah. just just got to keep keep positive and keep focused. Yeah, well, Matt, thank you so much for your for your time today and joining us on the Euro Puck podcast. And uh, yeah, hopefully, I'll uh, be able to see you at the rink in, in Nottingham again soon. But I'm sure our, our viewers and our listeners have uh, found all your stories really interesting, and particularly the the memories of the players for our, for our older listeners will. Uh, We'll have brought back memories uh, for them. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me, Chris. You take care. Yeah, you too. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for coming on the Euro Puck podcast for this week. Uh, stay tuned uh, next week as well. We've got another fantastic guest. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any thoughts, opinions or questions about today's show or any of our other shows, uh, then you can either leave a comment in our YouTube section. You can uh, follow us and ask us on Twitter at Europook Podcast, or you can go on to Hayden's Twitter, which you can see on screen. Again, if you're watching the YouTube version uh, at OddmanRushYT or myself at Chris underscore Gansby. We have got so many fantastic guests uh, coming up for you in the next few weeks. We're sorting them out almost on a daily basis now. Um, but for this episode, thank you very much for watching. Stay safe, keep well, and goodbye. <laughs>